Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Jui Zhang will defend the academic thesis towards more dose efficient cryogenic electron microscopy of biological samples. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Yes, thank you. So, dear Prorector, dear Defense Committee members, dear family, colleagues, and friends, in the coming 15 minutes, I will give a brief overview of my thesis titled Towards More Dose Efficient Cryogenic Electron Microscopy of Biological Samples. So, cryogen has become a very important tool for structural biology. And in 2015, the nature has uh, highlighted cryogen as the method of the year. And it was a decade ago, and cryogen was referred to blobology, because we can only get blobs for protein structures, which means no resolution. And it was since 2013, and the resolution revolution, we can get high resolution structure of the protein. We can solve each individual amino acids there. And nowadays, we can even get atomic resolution. Then we can see each individual atoms. So that the Nobel Prize was awarded to, uh, in chemistry, was awarded to Jacques de Bochet, Johann Frank, and Richard Henderson in 2017 for developing cryo-electron microscopy for high resolution structural de determination of biomolecules in solution. But what is a cryo-EM? <laughs> I think everybody knows what is a light microscope. And for electron microscope, we use instead of photons, but we use electron to image our sample because the electron has much lower wavelengths, so we can get higher resolution. And the cryo-EM keeps the sample at minus 180 degrees, so we can keep the sample at close to native states, and we can also reduce the radiation damage. So cryo has been also a very important tool for developing vaccine for the COVID-19 pandemics. And as the video show here, the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was the component who bind with the ACE2 receptor in our host cell and then bring the cell uh, and virus together and start the infection process. And so cryo has revealed high resolution structure of the spike protein so that we can develop a vaccine. And to generate antibody in our body to stop, to interfere the uh, infection. And, but how does cryo work? Uh, so there's one important method in cryo in determining high resolution structure is called single particle analyze. So in single particle analyze, we first start from a purified sample, which means there is one type of protein, hopefully, in the solution. And we will apply a, a very small droplet of the sample in the solution, uh, from the solution to the uh, sample holder. We call it grid in an uh, electron microscope. A size sample holder is just three millimeter in diameter. But such, even such a small droplet of sample, three microliter is too much and too thick for electron microscope. So we need to absorb most of the sample and leave only 20 to 100 nanometer of the sample six sample on the grid and then put to liquidation for a rapid cryo cooling. Such process called vitrification and it is done in a vitrobot which was developed in Maastricht and is now used worldwide by uh, more than 1200 uh, groups. And inside this machine we will use a blotting paper to absorb uh, uh, extra sample on the grid and so that we can get a thing enough sample. So after vitrification we would expect uh, for ideal case, we would expect a single layer of protein embedded in a thin vitro size with random orientation and sufficient concentration so that we can put the sample in the electron microscope and collect 2D projection of these each individual proteins. And with an electron detector, we would collect probably thousands or millions of protein images, and then we can average and align align and average all these particle images, so we can get 2D classification of these proteins. So, and with the orientation and the information known for each individual particle, we could obtain a high resolution reconstruction of the uh, protein structure. And from the high resolution map, we can obtain a good atomic model from it. So overall, 
a single particle analysis, we start from a sample in solution and collect noisy uh, protein images, and then we build atomic model from it. It is a really good method to determine high resolution structure, but uh, there are still lots of problems and we can uh, need, need, we need, need to improve. So here we come to the main topic of my thesis towards more dose efficient cryogenic electron microscopy of biological samples. We will first talk about the sample. We introduce the benchmark sample to characterize uh, cryogenic hardware and software development. And we also discuss the sample size limitation, how small the protein can be started by the single particle analyzed cryogenic. And then we talk about very important issue with imaging non-conductive specimen, which is charging in the electron microscope. And we also integrate a detector, a hybrid pixel detector to the current quarium workflow. And we discuss a few alternative strategies uh, for the current defocus phase contrast imaging. And these are the five chapters of my thesis. First of all, a benchmark sample. So, as I introduced before, for an ideal sample, we would expect a single layer of protein with random orientation and sufficient concentration embedded in same vitreous size. But that is not always the case. And sometimes we may have preferred orientation, which means all protein may have one or two orientation, and then we cannot obtain high resolution reconstruction. And sometimes we may even end up with nothing in the hole. So that we introduce a Benchmark sample, here the cat, but it's not a cat, it's the <laughs> ferritin from um, mycobacterial tuberculosis. And why it's good? Because it has high symmetry, 24 identical copies. It has a good molecular weight, around 540, 490 kilodalton, and is stable. And more importantly, it can be purified with a simple, simple protocol and high yield. We obtain a 1.9 angstrom map of this protein with a 300 kilovolt titan cryos. So th we believe that this is a good protein for characterizing quarium hardware and software development, and we will use it for the coming chapters. And a ferritin with this molecular weight at around 500 kilodalton is far from being the smallest protein that can be started by single particle quarium. And so currently, this, there are hemoglobins at the molecular weight of 32 kilodalton has been solved by quarium at 6.4 angstrom. Then how small the protein we can, so we can study using quarium? So that we did simulation with realistic parameter of uh, ice, dose, uh, electron detector, and the beam characteristics. So figure A on the right shows a simulated micrograph of hen egg white lysozyme. And the result shows with an ideal faceplate, face plate, we could obtain a good 2D class, class averages so that we can build a 3D model from it. So we anticipate that with sufficient hardware and software development, and especially with a faceplate, we could solve protein as small as 14 kilodalton in the future by query EM. We also talk about charging in Quarium. And so what is charging? So when we put a specimen in the uh, query in the electron microscope, and if the sample is non-conductive, and for life science application is typically non-conductive, and the electron hits the specimen, it will kick out the secondary electron from the sample surface and generate charging there. So this charging can be very detrimental to the image contrast and stop of prevent us from obtaining high resolution reconstruction. We, so that we deposit a single layer of graphene on the uh, normal sample grid, and with the help of graphene, we can mitigate charging effect. So we can get back the high contrast images back again, and we can do high resolution reconstruction. In terms of a real experimental data, this is the charged micrograph you don't see uh, clear uh, protein images. And this is a micrograph of, uh, with the help of graphene, we get back the high resolution uh, uh, protein images again. And with the help of graphene, we can obtain a high resolution reconstruction of the, our ferritin and with some special uh, beam, beam condition. And 
more interestingly, we can get a, a good reconstruction of a protein side chain at y electron per square angstrom, the very first fraction of the uh, data. We also worked on detector. The detector was a very important contributor to the resolution revolution in 2013. And, but here we work on a hybrid pixel detector, TimePix3. The TimePix3 is a real event-driven detector. It, ha it has simultaneous output of uh, energy and time information of each individual event at the resolution of 1.56 nanoseconds. And it has noiseless readout. We integrate such a detector to our 200 kV Artica in uh, Maastricht and perform single particle analyze. We could obtain a good resolution of the ferritin, and so it means it's a good detector for nodal imaging. So we anticipate that with the, uh, the integration of the such detector to the cryo workflow could expand the, the application of the cryo because it allows both low-dose imaging and diffraction experiment. One of the main constraints, another one, not charging, but uh, to when we uh, collect data from life, for life science sample, is the radiation damage. From the movie here, we can see clearly that when electron hits the specimen, we will first lose high uh, resolution information of the, uh, our protein images, and then we lose the contrast of the, all the protein, and the hydrogen gas generated, which are the white uh, bubbles here, and at the end, you will see the melt of the ice because uh, sample heat up. So it means we can only use a few electron per square angstrom to collect high resolution data. In other words, each electron counts. So in my thesis, I discussed a few alternative strategies for the current defocus phase contrast imaging, which could poten which potentially have higher uh, dose uh, efficiency. We discuss the use of a phase plate, the electron cryotychography, and electron holography, and more other techniques. These techniques could uh, have potentially have better uh, dose efficiency, so we anticipate this technique could further expand, uh, it push the NIPI soft size, structural heterogeneity, and uh, the resolution at which one can study the building blocks of life. To summarize, in my thesis, I talk about I introduce a benchmark sample, bacterial ferritin B, to characterize aquarium hardware software workflow uh, development, and I discuss uh, the size limitation of the aquarium. And the result shows with an ideal phase plate, we could solve uh, small protein structures. We also talk about charging effect, and with the help of graphene, we could mitigate charging effect. Uh, we integrate a hybrid pixel detector to the Quarium workflow, and it shows it's a good detector for both low-dose imaging and diffraction experiment. We discuss a few alternative strategies which have potentially have better dose efficiency. So we hope our research could help to expand the limits of Quarium in structural biology, and so that we can visualize a larger range of protein structures at higher resolution in more conformational states, and have, so that we can have a better understanding of the building box, blocks of life. Yeah, just a few backup slides. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> now I give the word back to uh, ProRect. Thank you very much for this clear and well-structured uh, presentation. I will now open the opposition by inviting the chair of the assessment committee, uh, Professor Van Rooij. He is a professor in plasma chemistry at the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Maastricht University. Yeah, thank you. Dear candidate, first of all, congratulations with a nice thesis, a broad perspective to many various, many different ways of improving resolution and electron microscopy. Of course, I have a few questions. That's the reason I'm here. And I would like to start really in the beginning, page three because there is a formula that I, use, uh, I know very well, so I like that. Uh, but I wonder, actually, have you applied this formula anywhere in your thesis work? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for kind words and your question. Uh, the f formula you mean is equation 1.1? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not 
uh, really uh, specified in one of the chapter, but uh, I mean, for electron microscope, we have uh, um, apertures and we have lenses, so it is uh, there fundamentally for to limit the resolution of the uh, um, electron microscope. Oh, yeah, maybe uh, let's dwell a little bit on it, just uh, so that I get it right. Huh? I, uh, I'm not. Uh sarcastic or so here, not at all. Uh, so I understand that if the wavelength of the probing particle is too large, uh, you are in problems. You do not uh, get any su anywhere sufficient resolution. But I'm a little bit struggling with the numerical aperture that is in the, in the formula. If I, for example, the first one that I see in figure 6.2, I see a, a graph. Uh, I oh now I have to I see that in the sample the beam goes through parallel. So I'm a bit wondering where in this picture which angle, opening angle or so should I take to to insert it in the formula? Do you have an idea on that? I think the uh angle uh so first, first of all, which, which image uh, you, you can can I was on now, yeah, arbitrarily, but at, uh, at this moment on page one hundred and seven, I see a, a schematic of uh, of an electron microscope measurement, and I see that the sample is in a collimated beam. So uh, there, you have a numerical aperture of of the objective of the objective uh, objectiveness. Uh, where again? Oh, in the objective lens, that yeah, one you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have to digest that. Could well be. I'm going to study that, thank you. <laughs> then I would like to move to the detector, uh, because you, you also mentioned in your speech uh, that the detector was responsible for the resolution revolution. Uh, what aspect in the detector made it that suddenly a big step was made in resolution? Was it pixel size, uh, sensitivity? Uh. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for your question. So, there are a few perspectives of the detector. So, uh, like more than 10 years ago, we used CCD detector. And CCD detector, you can only acquire one image. Then, uh, when it comes to the mon uh, MAPS detector, monolithic uh, active pixel detector, it first can acquire multiple images, uh, like multiple frames per second. Then you can have a, not image in movie mode. Then you can correct the uh, movement of the sample in the electron microscope yeah. is not still because uh, sample is moving. Then you have re electron heat the specimen. Specimen will start to bulge. And then another reason is that uh, it gives a better modulation transfer function. So at the, it keeps the high resolution information there, and basically less noise. Okay. And now moving to the detector that you started implementing, the TimePix three. I see there are also a few uh, characteristics that you like about it, but after reading the chapter, I've, I'm not completely sure what is now the real aspect that uh, that makes a difference. Because you talk about time resolution, you talk about sub-pixel resolution, you talk about lower energy uh, uh, sensitivity. What is that you like most? That is a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Actually, I like all of them. And so first of all, we use it, this detector and the subpixel, so, uh, and because it gives uh, lots of information from the each individual events, so we can do subpixel so, uh, localization. And this uh, boosts the modulation transfer function. And the high resolution, uh, basically the higher the time resolution of the each individual event, there, the more information you have, then you can have a better training of the neural network and then uh, have a higher precision of the prediction. Okay, you used now two keywords that I was going to anyways question <laughs> you about, namely the time resolution. That's something that is not really clear to me. Why time resolution? It seems to me that you are averaging over long times. So I would think, uh, how do you care about uh, time resolution? Yeah, so... Um, so we have electron heat detector with each, each individual event. And, but I mean, a event, each electron will generate a huge amount of uh, 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 electron hole pairs in the sensor. And this, the, actually the, at the back is the, um, the signal you received is the bunch of electron hole pairs. And then you get lots of information. And then this 
the time resolution is the time of the arrival when this electron hole pair received the uh, electronics. And this res time resolution is at 1.56 nanoseconds. And we use this a bunch of uh, uh, signal from one electron hits the detector to train the neural network. And which means that the, much, the, more, resolu uh, the more information you have, the higher the time resolution you have, then you can basically train, you supply more information to the uh, neural network and then you get a better pre prediction. Okay, maybe I have time in a minute to ask you about the neural network, but let's go first then to the figure 5.1. Uh, because there I see many data points uh, and I see humps in, in, in between, but I, I do not really recognize what is now good and what is bad. So uh, the, uh. the y-axis, it's only <laughs> slight differences on the y-axis. Are these are this meaningful differences? What, what, what is the quantity here that you would like to have? So, yeah. So is the intensity of the... So, uh, yeah, what we acquired, the image A, B, C, D, these are the Fourier transform, basically the power spectrum uh, of the, uh, the uh, cross-grating. Actually, it's a morphous goat. We are looking at the diffraction. Basically, the Fourier transform is kind of the diffraction pattern. And we are looking at the specific ring, like 2.3 axon ring. And basically, the higher the intensity of this ring, the more stable your mi microscope is or detector is, then uh, you anticipate that the integration of such a detector, like cooling the electron, electron, uh, electronic noise, doesn't uh, destructively, destructively affect the performance of the detector. So basically, the higher the point there, the higher the intensity of, the of this ring, the ring in red, the more stable uh, the microscope is. The higher mm -hmm. we get more information for, from the high resolution information. Yeah. I think I will ask you on the neural networks during the reception. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Satisfied. Good idea. Uh, because now we will continue the opposition uh, by Professor Zandbergen. And he is an emeritus professor of electron microscopy uh, from Delft University. Dear candidate, dear Yui. Um, Yui was a student in, in my group, and I uh, thought he's an excellent student. So I introduced him to Peter, and the results you see quite here, right? Uh, so I read a very nice thesis, and I would like to go with you to page 100. And there are three cats there, <laughs> two white <laughs> one and one with uh, some black spots on it. And I would like to add a black cat there. And the reason I'm going to explain now, and because all information that is in from your sample is in the diffracted beams, right? So why not get rid of the central beam? And you get a much better signal to noise ratio. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for kind words and your question. Um, first of all, I totally agree with you. <laughs> And so, uh, like a face plate, uh, if you ask me about that, if you give a 90-degree uh, phase shift to the central beam or to the diffract beam, I would say central beam, because uh, then uh, you kind but of... I would like to get rid of the central beam completely. Why do you need it? Because uh, as what I educated from the book <laughs> of the electron microscope, the phase contrast is formed by the interference of the direct but, beam but and in case you only use the defective beams you don't need a phase contrast anymore for, you mean for uh, so 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 what the problem is with the defective beams that each uh, uh, each of the defected information diffraction information gets some phase shifts but if you use an uh, an image corrected microscope you can use uh, uh, combine all the defective beams into a uh, yeah, a dark field m uh, image. That's why I called it a black cat. Uh, and if you do that correctly at zero focus, you get the optimum situation, according to me. Can you comment? I, it, it, it would be a really interesting experiment to try. Uh, but uh, if you bring the diffractive beam to in focus, 
and the beam is in para uh, on the sample. I'm not 100% sure if you will get the image or not for the, because then if it's beam is parallel, then you have uh, um, the contrast transfer function of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. zero. Uh, there's yeah, so, you, so, so what you need is a contrast transfer function that is such that all the defected beams are getting the face, the same phase shift, which you can do with a beam, uh, an image corrected microscope, right? So yeah. maybe we should talk about this later, <laughs> yeah. and we go to the next uh, next question. Thank you. And that yeah. is, uh, I've con I've got you uh, on time. Uh, so you mentioned that in the Medipix you can get some time resolution, but what is the time that uh, um, if uh, that beam damage uh, is take is is occurring? So you get an, a, a pass, uh, an electron is passing. Mm -hmm. And how much time does it take before it, the, the, the first damage is occurring? Is there, so maybe I should rephrase the question. Can you shoot so many electrons on the sample that you uh, can get sufficient information before the damage is actually occurring? It is a very interesting, quest interesting question. But so your thesis is too too short, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, but by the time, if you, if if the electron has an energy of like three hundred kilo uh, kilo electron volt or one, whatever, even one hundred kilo electron volt, it's high energy. By the time it hits the specimen, it will deposit energy there, and you will cause there will be radiation damage. And if you say, but, but what, 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 what is, the, what is the, the, the actual happening with beam damage? What, what, there's a sequence of, of things happening in yeah. the molecule, and what is the time scale for that sequence? So you break the bond of the chemicals, and yes. you generate radicals, and you generate hydrogen gases, and you are also uh, make, uh, because I mean, for cryoam, you uh, introduce stress when you do vitrification and then it, yeah but but what is the time that is so so you you break a bond and you form new bonds what is the time between the breaking of the bond and the formation of the new bond uh, to be honest i don't know but i speculate it in the uh, femton second or picosecond uh, probably I, I have no idea actually um, ah, no, I, uh, I, can I ask more questions? Yes, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I would like to go to, um, let's see, where, where was I? Money seems to be an important uh, issue, right? Not only uh, the, 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 uh, your research costed money, but also the microscope costs money. And then you mentioned that going to lower kill voltages, uh, you decrease the cost of the experiments. Yeah. Um, how much, how low would you like to go? Actually, uh, not in money-wise, is pr probably to go to a few cents. But uh, what what can you still achieve with, let's say, one million uh, uh, euros, microscope-wise? Can you build a microscope that gives the resolution that you need and a camera that can give you the resolution and time resolution? To be honest, I've, I was never involved in the morning issue. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically don't know how much a 100 kV uh, electron microscope cost. But uh, basically, the, let's say, the lowered energy the less the uh, uh, money you spend on the down on the whole systems, and then uh, I would expect with my million euro, my, from my uh, perspective, uh, I speculate that a uh, hundred kV microscope with the time peaks would be enough. Yeah, that is my uh, opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and hundred kV could give uh, sufficient uh, signal to noise ratio to uh, to the sample, and then uh, we could. I anticipate that it could, we could reach uh, two angstrom or even atomic resolution with a uh, 100 kV microscope. 
And, and information that is in the object, uh, what is the resolution of that? Is that in the order of 1.5 angstrom or one angstrom or, or even less? So now there are already three angstrom uh, reconstruction from 100 kV microscope uh, in RMB. I think people did it. And uh, but they yeah they use Iger detector from uh, 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 from uh, I forget the, I suddenly forget the name of the company but it's Iger detector and it is actually not in my opinion it's not as good as Timepix and we can uh, with the Timepix we would anticipate or even Timepix four the next generation we could re reach two angstrom or uh, even below two angstrom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will continue the opposition uh, with Dr. Jacobi, and he's an assistant professor at the Department of Bio Nano Science from the University of Delft. Dear candidate, dear you, eh? um, thanks for having me in your committee. I really enjoyed reading your thesis, and I want to congratulate you and, and the supervisors on these re nice results, um, which I think cover a very broad range of, of topics of relevance to improving uh, CryVM. And I want to talk to you first um, about Chapter 4, where you're studying charging, and you're addressing um, somehow a conundrum in, in CryVM that, in principle, you would expect that the first few frames uh, that you collect in, in a movie of a, a cryo sample should contain the highest resolution information because the sample is most pristine, so has undergone uh, least radiation damage. And still, um, I think Richard Henderson was the first one to show that, um, in principle, in the reconstruction, if you do reconstructions of these first few frames, you actually do not gain much to the, to the final resolution and, and reconstruction. Um, that has been changed a little bit once Bayesian polishing came into, into play. Um, and there are two, uh, yeah, two uh, effects that, that essentially are expected to contribute to this. One of them is specimen movement, which um, uh, Bayesian polishing can, uh, can partially correct for. And the second is charge, which is something you are studying. And in figure 4.1, you, you explain a very nice experiment that you, that you did um, to look at the effect of charging um, on the uh, <coughs> on a diffracted beam that you're imaging uh, out of focus. And what you see is that, that um, if you have an electron beam that's impinging on your specimen, you build up a localized charge on that specimen. And if you then take a diffraction of a, a defocused diffraction um, image of your, of your beam, you see that that beam either expands or contracts depending on whether you're imaging in overfocus and underfocus. And you're showing this in, in figure uh, 4.1 um, D and, and G and B to F. Um, I want to ask you, so then, sorry, maybe I, I need to expand a little bit. In figure 4.3, then you're looking at what would happen if you would have a specimen that actually has a conductive um, layer. So you have, you prepared specimens that have a conductive graphene layer, and you're showing that in that case, uh, you do not see those changes anymore, which is very nice. But now assume you, you don't have access to the nice graphene grids you made, um, but you yeah, you have acquired these, these data that you're presenting in figure 4.1. Can you imagine how you could use these to maybe improve image processing techniques to still recover more information than you currently do? And if you think uh, you can, how would you do that? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, thank you for asking this question again, because I'm really expecting someone to ask me a question about charging, which is my... the really the, my favorite chapter. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, can you repeat? Uh, with, if we don't have graphene. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay. Um, my question is, uh, imagine you, you have a sample. You do not have access to grids that contain yeah. a graphene layer. So yeah. you're imaging in normal quantifold grids. Yeah. And you have now estimated that in the first few electrons that are impinging on your sample, you're changing a parameter in your sample through microlensing that, that is uh, coming about by accumulation of charges on your yeah. specimen that cannot be carried away um, or neutralized. Uh, how could you use that information to improve image processing? Or the question maybe is, can you improve image processing yeah. to account for these effects? Yeah. Thank you. Um, if you don't have graphene grid, then you make the beam is the conduct to the uh, conductive layer, which is the either carbon or uh, I mean, it's, if it's quantified, it's carbon. If it's ultra good for you, it's uh, gold. Then you have your electrofield, 
uh, from the sample like connected to, to the it's not only I mean the electron it's always a field we are looking at the field the electric field like connect to the conductive layer and then you let the charge spread that is the way to mitigate charging and in the experiment of the if you look at the uh, figure 4.5 so even we have the beam smaller than the hole size, the beam is com completely on the ice layer without any conductive material, you can still obtain a 3.5 angstrom of the ferritin. That is amazing. So <clears throat> like thanks to basic polishing <laughs> and uh, all the motion correction algorithms, and we can still get a kind of good reconstruction, but it's not, I mean, for ferritin, it's not the best. We don't want to have charging. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But I um, let me elaborate a little bit more <laughs> on the on the question again. So, what in if you go back to Figure 4.1, where showing where you're showing this experiment, which parameter is actually changing while your diffracted beam expands uh, or shrinks? Uh, uh, it's, it's, sorry, thank you. It's defocus. I think it's defocus. Yeah. yeah exactly. It's yeah. the defocus. So if you if you know that change in defocus, how could you use that information to improve your image processing of the first few frames? Yeah, you you can apply a default. So so you so now I mean for image processing you have one defocus for of the average frames, but that is not optimal. You can do defocus for each frames and def uh, a CTF correction for each frames, but there is one problem: the defocus change of the first few frames when there's charging is not isotopic. So probably somewhere here, I mean, it's in the one micrograph is probably I mean on the left is. A plus one micron on the left, right is minus one micron. So to do such a CTF correction for a charged micrograph, it would be really challenging. So yeah, <laughs> I agree. There are experimental challenges uh, yeah. with it, but uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That was uh, what I was looking for. Um, I want to ask you a second question on this chapter. Um, so in in Table 4.1, you are showing the data statistics that you've acquired. Um, for data sets that you acquired for a normal quantifold grid, quantifold grid with graphene, um, with a small beam, and both of them with, with a large beam. Um, and then in supplementary figure 4.5, you're showing the, the Rosenthal-Henderson plots of these data sets. Um, and you determine from the slope of these, these curves, um, where you're setting out the logarithm of the number of particles versus the inverse resolution squared, you're showing the B factors that you determine from these slopes. And then I see that, for example, in your quantifoil um, uh, sample with graphene, where you use a small beam, you have a B factor of 84 angstrom squared. And in your quantifoil, normal quantifoil grid without graphene, uh, where you've used a 50 micrometer C2 aperture, you also have a B factor of about 83. But still in your table, um, in your table 4.1, you're showing that you needed about three to four times as many particles for these two different data sets to uh, acquire approximately the same resolution. How do you explain this? So this B factor, you uh, <coughs> you basically you plot the uh, this dot and you make linear regression. But if you look at the dots of the purple line, and these are quite noisy, and it's an estimation. It's not really uh, something that uh, strictly, if you say, okay, it's 4, uh, 83 or 84, it's really that showing the, your data, I mean, it's an estimation uh, of the, yeah. And also the purple doors are quite noisy. That's also just the, uh, uh, also the, cre the remark I got from the, this paper because it's now just submitted on the, rev on the, on, on the review. This is also a remark I get back from, uh, the reviewer. So okay, I did not review it, <laughs> um, but I thank you for the remark, I mean. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, Do I still have time for uh, another question? No, unfortunately, okay. we have to continue. Um, and the opposition will be continued by Professor Eline Kooi. She's a professor of medical physics, especially vascular imaging at uh, the Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine at Maastricht University, and today she's also the secretary of the degree committee. Uh, thank you so much, uh, dear candidate. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate you with your excellent uh, thesis, and my warm congratulations are also expressed to your first supervisor, Professor Ravelli, and also to your other supervisors, Professor uh, Peters and uh, Dr. Lopez Iglesias. 
Uh, as an MR, MRI physicist, I'm not so familiar with electron microscopy, but your thesis was written very clearly. Um, so therefore, it was a great pleasure um, to study it and to learn more about this uh, fascinating field. And uh, your thesis contributes substantially to the improvement of cryo-EM. And as a physicist, I was also intrigued by the coffer, uh, because there is a cat in the box. And that reminds me of uh, a famous thought uh, experiment in quantum physics, the uh, Schrodinger cat. And then I noticed that also proposition one is from one of the founding fathers of quantum physics. Um, so um, can one of the paronyms read proposition one, please? We have to remember that what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our met method of questioning from Werner Heisenberg. Thank you. Um, so I wondered, um, why did you include this proposition? And do you need to take into account quantum physics as an engineer in the field of electron microscopy? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. So the reason I include here is uh, uh, the primary reason is due to charging. Per, uh, charging chapter. So mm -hmm. when the electron heats the specimen, there are lots of things happen, like charging, like radiation damage, like movement. So we are not only observing the sample itself, but we are also obser observing the these effects. Mm -hmm. And this effect may uh, I mean, uh, interfere the interpretation of our results. So that's the primary reason I put it here. And if you ask if there's anything about quantum physics, uh, not in this chapter, but there is chapter, <laughs> and the uh, review chapter, uh, chapter five, oh, sorry, chapter six, <laughs> the review uh, review paper, there's a, uh, one technique called the quantum sorter. So, um, so basically when we, ob when we uh, collect an image of the sample, we are collecting the uh, XY, the spatial information of the electron, but for an electron, it carries a huge amount of information. It also carries uh, orbital, orbital angular momentum. And this, if we want to, so if we want to acquire the information such as the, the symmetry of the particle, the orientation of the particle, and x, y, the spatial uh, information of the electron is, let's say, it is not optimum uh, property to observe. But uh, the orbital angular momentum can give you much better, uh, I mean, easier way to interpret the, in, interpret the, uh, uh, let's say, the sym symmetry and the orientation of the particle. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, thank you so much for the explanation. And but my question is about uh, chapter four, so we don't need quantum physics yet uh, <laughs> today. Um, but um, I was just wondering. Um, you uh, recommend to use a uh, graphene laser for improved uh, image quality and also improved single particle analysis. Uh, but under which circumstances do you recommend to use this layer? Uh, I would recommend if you have a graphene uh, and you can prepare, let's try, if you try with graphene, great. And if you prepare a good sample, then use it. Yeah. And also, then currently, one of the main bottleneck in QuarEM is the sample preparation. Mm -hmm. And the sample preparation, uh, if you add graph in there, then uh, you don't really know that your protein will, uh, how you will interact with your, with your graphene. But in some cases, most of cases, and I don't know, sorry, I don't know if it's most of case, cases, for ferritin, it's really good. And we can prepare a good thing sample, and we don't have a preferred orientation. and then we can use it because it's reduced radiation. Uh, not uh, sorry, the movement and it's so it gives a better resolution. Mm -hmm. And you can also have the beam smaller than the uh, than the hole. You don't really need um, normal, let's say, quantum foil or uh, or or, or uh, ultra good foil. And you can even make the beam smaller. Mm -hmm. Then you speed up the the experiment. You can have much higher throughput. I mean, uh, what I knew from the um, 
uh, drug uh, industry, they like uh, drug design industry, they really screen lots of uh, samples and they need the really high throughput and this will be the good option. Okay, yeah. yeah, because I don't know so much about electron uh, microscopy, so yeah. uh, you have the advantage that you can use a small beam, eh, because yeah. uh, you don't need to uh, touch the uh, the grid, right? Uh, and then, but this this small beam, what advantages that give you? Sorry, uh, what what advantage is that uh, is there for using a smaller beam? It uh, it can reduce the movement of the particle. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Well, it's very fascinating and I also would like to discuss more, but because of the sake of time, I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you. Okay. Well done. Thank you. Um, then we will continue the opposition um, by the next opponent, which is Professor uh, Sachse. He's a professor of structural biology from the Ernst Huska Center for Microscopy and Spectroscopy with Electrons in Jülich. I hope I, this is right. Thank you. First of all, I, uh, dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you for this really uh, comprehensive work and really a nice piece of overview in the various directions of, on how cry methodology can be improved. Um, I would like to go back to your simulations. Uh, so this is in the chapter two, I believe, so on, on the lysozyme, which is a very intriguing sample for structural biology in general. Um, and I wanted to know one of your main conclusions there is that the technique uh, using faceplate uh, you know, would enable you um, to actually achieve sufficient contrast to determine the three-dimensional structure at high resolution. And so I would uh, first of all like to ask you to detail a bit more on how you constructed um, the simulation and what kind of noise models um, did you assume and also how you took into account ice thickness. Yeah, uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and your question. So first, uh, noise. Noise is the most difficult uh, part to simulate, much more difficult than, than signal. And we just use Poisson noise from the, uh, uh, basically Poisson noise, yeah. And for eye thickness, for different eyes, we, uh, so we first put the potential of the uh, sample in the, I mean, we have a generated box. Uh, the sample sa uh, thickness is dependent on the box, thickness of the box. Uh, and we first put the potential of the uh, sample there, like ferritin or lysozyme, and then we fill the rest up with the uh, ice potential. With That's a constant it. potential, yes. basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could you think of, I mean, let's say you had all the computational means in the world, so could you think of other ways of still making this more correct? Because I guess that's an approximation, I assume. Yeah, I mean, all the simulations include those of uh, assumptions and approximation. And um, if you ask me how to provide, to make it more realistic, and um, from, I would say, we first need to make the beam characteristic uh, more close to the uh, to, to to the realistic parameters. The uh, the convergence angle from the beam we use is a few mini rad, and as it reported by uh, Richard Henderson and Chris Russo, uh, Robert Glazer, they say for quarium it now can be as small as few micron rad. So then it again boosted the signal to noise ratio because the, sm the smaller the uh, spatial co coherence uh, of the gun of the beam then the less the damp of the envelope function of the uh, microscope and what are others uh, then uh, so i currently don't perhaps know. related yeah. to the second part of my questions with, yeah. which was um how to how you took into account the ice thickness um I mean, how did you actually? I didn't quite catch it because you just assumed. Uh, uh, it's a simple model. We put the constant of the ice uh, potential and fill in the box, and fill the uh, so wherever there is no protein, we fill the uh, uh, potential of the con of constant potential of the ice of the water there in the box, and then uh, just 
then we have a uh, average potential of the from uh, like z projection of the potential of the box and then we just do, uh, start the simulation yeah uh, how to make it more realistic uh, i currently the how about putting another set of molecules there then you mean is uh, the pu pu yeah in this case oh yeah in this case uh, we could make yes thank you for your question we can make uh, the protein more now is one sim one protein with one conformation we could make it more realistic yeah thank you and we can give more confirmation there we feel uh, the simulation with more confirmation and uh, other proteins then i mean then in this case uh, some sample denaturized and put a part of the protein one uh, uh, one chain of the protein or the other type of protein there to make it more kind of noisy yeah, yeah. Yes, impurity yes. samples yeah i agree you. and yeah. you could even put water molecules in there if you wanted to yeah. in your simulations yeah um yeah thank you very much um i would wanted to still elaborate a little bit more on the on the later part where you uh, give an overview of different, uh, you know, potentially very dose efficient um, techniques um, that are not so commonly used in the typical mainstream cryo-EM world. And one of the techniques I was particularly interested in is um, that you elaborate on is electron holography. So could you um, go a little bit more into detail and explain in contrast to other techniques like uh, cryostem or tychography, how electron holography would be uh, beneficial uh, for in the cryo-EM experiment. Thank you for your question. So electron holography first is not a STM mode. Then you have a parallel flood beam. And then you simply give a contrast transfer function because you interfere with another reference beam. Then you give a cosine contrast transfer function and then it boosts the low spatial frequency signal. Instead of, instead of the currently focused uh, phase contrast imaging, you have a low spatial resolution uh, at zero. And uh, for electron holography, compared to other techniques, as time or whatever, and it, if you select the sideband of the Fourier transform of the, of the image, and it can become a perfect energy filter, a filtered a micrograph. And in this case, uh, yeah, it's basically remove the inelastic scattering, the noise, and yeah, it's, it's good. And what else? Uh, uh, and is that a realistic few... setting? Can you, uh, yeah, what, what keeps you from doing it? Are there applications out there um, already that have shown that this will work? Uh, could, could you repeat your question again? Sorry. Um, so are there applications out there that from other laboratories that have used this technique, exactly how you described it in for a cryo-M experiment? Not for off-axis holography, but there's one in-axis ho in access holography uh, study. The I think is also they reconstruct ferritin at uh, quite high resolution, if I remember correctly, like three, four angstrom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Dijkgraaf. She's uh, Associate Professor of Biochemistry at Maastricht University. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Uh, dear candidate, I first would like to congratulate you, and of course, all, I would also warmly congratulate your, your team, your promotion team, with the completion of your uh, PhD thesis. It's really nice research, w w w and it's also described very clearly, so my compliments uh, for that. First, I would like to ask you a question about proposition number one, and I would like to ask one of your paranyms to read this one aloud. We have to remember that what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning by Werner Heisenberg. Yeah, my apologies for uh, this repetition, but uh, <laughs> um, in my opinion, this is a very anthropocentric uh, proposition. So that, that, that's really my, uh, yeah, uh, seen through the eyes of a human being. Can you agree uh, on that? Or? Uh, highly esteemed opponents, thank you for your kind words and your question. Uh, could you rephrase? Uh, <laughs> well, in, in my opinion, it's, it's really uh, um, 
yeah, uh, seen uh, f through a human being, th this sentence, so as of uh, that we are not part of nature. But maybe we can uh, discuss this also later, uh, th this uh, proposition. But uh, I think it's not for human being. Uh, I mean, we are definitely part of nature. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, the way we, op I mean, when we're observing, we are interfere with the object. Exactly. So it's uh, exactly. always true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, okay. Then yeah. uh, we agree on this. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, then I would like to go with you to page um, three of chapter one. And as a trained chemist, when I saw this equation uh, for the for improving the resolution, I thought, well. What if you reduce the wavelengths? Well, we discussed this here already, and you also addressed this in your thesis. Well, it's not really an option uh, because of the damage you, you cause to, to your compounds. But I also saw uh, that the refractive index of the medium is very important. And as a chemist, I thought, can we gain there something? Because you use vitreous eyes. Are there media that have a very high refractive index that can be used and that maybe can also, uh, um, yeah, take away the problem of the of the charging you, you face? So, do do you know whether something is going on is in this field to to get uh, improved media? In the elect, I think in electron microscopy. I, I first of all for light microscope, I know there is some immersive system. Then you uh, put in the water or something, then uh, have high refractive index to improve the resolution. And for electron microscope, you really need to do it in a vacuum. And as far as I know, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, for my knowledge, uh, no, because uh, in the vacuum, and you also don't want your electron to interact with other objects. This will cause noise. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and yeah, I indeed yeah, saw yeah. because I also looked this up yeah, because I was really interested in this, yeah. and I saw oh, that at, at some microscopy techniques they use uh, different media that they are really developing high refractive index polymers. But yeah, I, I thought I can ask you whether this this would be useful for for cryo EM, but apparently I, I, you you think that's not the case. Possibly, if you don't aiming for atomic resolution, if you aim for I mean, I'm just speculate. If you yeah, aim yeah. for nanometer resolution or even less, then uh, possible is a very interesting idea. It, 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 I think it's possible, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And there are like in SEM, SEM, then you can do environmental SEM and then uh, it's not really high pressure, uh, 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 vacuum, possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. Might, might be interesting to yeah. for yeah. other researchers to, uh, <laughs> to invest some time and money in that, yes, <laughs> okay. Um, when I read chapter seven, it was very interesting to me because there, uh, when I go to page 130, it was, if I'm correct. Yes, well, it starts actually at the end of uh, page 129. Uh, there you write down that all the structures that are now in alpha folds uh, that have been, yeah, these structures have been determined using techniques like X-ray, cryo-EM and NMR. Then you write down that these techniques only capture protein in a specific specific conformation, while proteins are dynamic entities. I do not fully agree on this, that all these techniques are uh, capture proteins in a specific conformation. I Can think for X-ray crystallography, you crystallize it, then they say they stay in the one conformation. That was, um, yeah. And for cryo electron microscopy, they are not really in one conformation, but when you solve the protein structure, you're averaging like thousand millions of the protein images in different But how about NMR? Ah, yeah, then it's different. Yeah, I'm not yeah. very familiar with NMR, but I think it's, if it's in solution, it's so like a solution MR, then you probably can solve a uh, different conformation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, NMR, yeah. You, you always do this in, in solution. Well, yeah. not always, there's also solid state NMR. But what also uh, uh, caught my attention was the intrinsic proteins, the intrinsically disordered proteins. Uh, they are very interesting. I give the word back to the protector. Thank you. No, well, the time uh, allotted is finished, but if you want to continue this dialogue, then it's possible. <laughs> well, I think we can do this uh, after this ceremony. Thank you very much. Okay.
Kui Zan. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request you and your company to await the results of our deliberation and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. I'm a lace is tied. Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because faith decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park because we're taking off. Hit the
Hui Zhang, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Ravelli is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Is he on? Yeah. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority, Fested by us, by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee, you present, I hereby confer upon you, Yu Isang, the degree of doctor, and grant you all the rights attached by customs and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree of and the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed by the official seal by the university. Dear Dr. Seng, dear Yui, we met for the first time in October 2018. Our group had just started a new EU project about electron microscopy, but with a group of hardcore physicists. Inspired by the concepts of quantum computing, this new consortium would develop quantum sorter for electron microscopy, which would revolutionize our field. Five years later, this promise still will stand up firm. The project was a fundamental long-term endeavor, which required a sheep with five legs. Someone who knows about quantum physics, electron microscopy, engineering, artificial intentions, but also chemistry, biology, protein structures. And we were convinced that we would need a postdoc for this position. And we advertised it as such, interviewed some candidates, but it was hard to find one. Our group had already some members with five, sheep with five legs, but a regular effort was, didn't help us to find you. Then Peter received a phone call from Henny Sandberger, he present in the thesis committee. He was jubilant about your Yui, as a Delft student who studied science, sustainable energy of technology. You had done a master project on solar panels but also worked with Henny in a clean room for designing, developing, and fabricating nanoreactors for transmission electron microscopy. Henny urged us to hire you as a PhD student for the job, and knowing that we can blindly trust Henny, we invited you and over for an interview. You gave a warm, fine presentation, and most importantly, you seemed to fit very well within the warm team 
within our warm team with diverse backgrounds. These backgrounds range from cell biology, biochemistry, computational biology, but not so much hardcore physics. So I think you won our hearts right away, but I was still left with the task how to deal with this consortium. Would you be a match to this EU consortium as well? And to decide on this, I joined you on the train trip back from Maastricht to Delft to have a deeper look into what this project really was and to have some proper discussions. Two and a half hours. I thought, let's see how far we get. I was a bit nervous about it, but by the time we passed by Sittard, you already convinced me. This is our man. You are thoughtful, genuine, enthusiastic, friendly, smart, intelligent, respectful, also for the different cultures you are working in and that you grew up in, and a good team player. We engaged together in Hardcore Physics Adventure of the Quantum Sorter program, and at one of the very first meetings, a joke was made, which was laughed by the physicists who were there. What is the worst thing that can happen to a physicist? That you win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. <laughs> Richard Hennison, a physicist by training, had just received a Nobel Prize for chemistry for his pioneering work on high resolution determination of biomolecules in solution. Together, we respected and read so many articles of him, often in great detail. And it was a great pleasure having done this together with you. And soon, you will start a new job with him it, at MRC Cambridge. Richard Henderson is retired, but undoubtedly you will have many lunches with him, of which we are very jealous. The Quantum Sorter was succeeded by other uh, successful projects. The Time Picks, together with Amsterdam Scientific Instruments. In addition, you helped our biochemistry team. And in the meantime, you were indispensable in the new student courses we were setting up, in particular nanobiology and biophysics. The bottom line was always that you were an excellent team player, smart worker, extremely loyal, and a dear friend of us. Countless memories could be summed up, such as a night train trip to Trieste, but also the retreat with Abril, the writing retreat with Abril in Bokrijk, where our brain efforts got a bit slightly distracted by the coat droppings and the coats nibbling on the lunch that you brought in your backpack. Last but not least, I wish to include all your friends and family and colleagues in this Laudatio and thank them. Science is team science, but intellectu both intellectually and socially. First, I'd like to include Peter and Carmen in this consultations, whose visions, input, guidance, and support were crucial throughout your entire PhD path. The feedback from all the referees, editors, but also here from the thesis defense committee, who were extremely flexible to help you out with this topic, which is um, far from daily work also for them. Our PhD students, Abril, Paul, Nafia, Snea, Kasper, all the other colleagues, Kevin, Heng, Ye, Yingya, Chris, René, Hans, Frank, Helma, Willi, Line, Nuria, Nusha, Pengang, Rafal, the Eriks. A big congratulations to the model who posed for all these nice illustrations in your booklet. Her name is Flora, it's the cat. You, you placed every Corona Zoom meeting in, that we had in the early Corona times in an interesting perspective when Flora was dropping by, <laughs> turning her back at us or making a big yaw in front of the camera. Deep, deep congratulations and appreciations also to your parents who have not seen you for far too long. We are very grateful for, to them that you let your son work with us for such a long time, including some dark and anxious periods. You can and should be very proud of them. And last but not least, also to Rong. I wish you a very happy long life together. Thank you. Dear Dr. Zhang, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I want to congratulate you with the degree that you obtained. And indeed, we shouldn't forget that you also did a, a large portion of your work during the difficult corona times. 
Um, as a Dean of the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences, I'm very proud that your work also uh, contributed to providing us with detailed images of life. But as was mentioned also in your statement number three, it's important to balance work and life. And I think that's also what you illustrated here in this picture. So I think it's time to now have a drink together. Uh, and um, my proposal is that uh, to the audience, I would like to ask to wait for a second. So first, the cortege uh, will leave to uh, the so-called refter. There you can uh, congratulate the young doctor, and thereafter we can have a chat together, either in the rafter or even in the beautiful sun outside. And hereby I want to close this academic session. Please.